Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Peterson. I have to say that uh, 12 Rules for Life was a great break from revision. Um, as you said uh, earlier in your talk, that conservatives, people who are temperamentally conservative, always seek to preserve the hierarchy. And in a kind of a healthy society, and people who are temperamentally liberal will always question those hierarchies. Is it inevitable, inevitable, in, sorry, inevitable then, that we will slowly move in that liberal direction, and that eventually those people who are liberally minded will question the very foundations of meaning, and we will be in a situation where conservatives don't want to budge because that is a fundamental hierarchy, and liberals don't want to stop because it's a logical progression of where they've been going. Well, it's, that's an eternal danger. Like, there's dangers on both sides. One is the danger of pathological order, and the other is the danger of pathological chaos. And the problem with the questioning tendency is that it knows no limits. And that's actually hard on people. Like, well, it's, very, it's actually very difficult orienting yourself in life if you happen to be very high in openness, very low in conscientiousness, and very high in neuroticism. Because you question everything and you're not stable. And you might be wildly creative, like that's a pretty good recipe for wild creativity. But that doesn't mean that it's tenable or sustainable. Because most creative ideas are not only wrong, they're, they're actually deadly. But some of them aren't. Some of them are absolutely vitally important. Right? And so part of the reason we have political discussion, or discussion at all, is to separate the wheat from the chaff. So the endless proclivity of the questioning tendency of the liberal left is that every axiom is open for infinite questioning. Well, that leaves you bereft. But the problem on the right is if you tighten things up too much, well, then you have no adaptive flexibility left, and you're in a sterile tyranny, a tyranny of stone. And then the environment shifts around you, and you're not prepared, and then everyone's done. So, the reason that free speech is so important, as far as I'm concerned, because, well, I don't even really think about it as free speech. I think it, about it as, what? Respect for the manifestation of the logos. It's something like that. That's the proper way of, of conceptualizing it, is that it keeps the balance between those two tendencies. Right? Because you, you need the questioning, and you need the order. And so you think, well, how much of each? And the answer is, the recipe changes day to day. And so you think, well, if it changes day to day, how are we going to keep up? And the answer is, by keeping up, right? Here we are, we're alive, right? We, we can keep up, but we do that by thinking. And we think by talking. And we, we think and talk by disagreeing. And, and we better disagree, conceptually, because then we don't have to act out stupid ideas that will kill us, right? Because, so, so really, the, the, abstract, the abstract territory of conceptual dispute is a substitute for war and death. And it can be a brutal substitute because conceptual disagreement can be very intense, but compared to war and death, it's hardly intense at all. And so you keep the, the, you keep the landscape open for serious dispute, including dispute that's offensive, obviously, because if you're ever going to talk about anything that's difficult, and why talk otherwise, then you're going to talk about things that are offensive to people. And you're going to do it badly. You're going to stumble around when you're formulating your thoughts. And that's horrible. It makes people anxious. It alienates them. But it's better than pain and death. And that's the alternative. So, Thank you. Uh, we'll take a question from um, upstairs. Please project your voice as there will be no microphone to the lady in the black. Well, it would be if I was trying to reduce all the individual variability to that. But to, uh, to note that people vary across a dimension is not necessarily simultaneously to limit all the variability to those dimensions. There's lots of other variability. And I, your question, to some degree, is whether the act of categorization is in itself a limitation on individual freedom, I think, if you push your question all the way down to the bottom. And the answer to that is, to some degree, yes, but it's also a precondition for individual freedom. So, <laughs> is that sufficient? But, but you sort of do have certain predispositions that you're giving in the same 
same way in which people from political correctness have tried to say this is what it means to be a woman, these are the kind of things that it is expected from a woman to do to defend herself. And it seems to me that you are making a similar claim about this is what conservative people do, and this is how they always relate to hierarchy. Well, I don't, I, I would say that I perhaps am doing that, but I don't see how that's the same as what the postmodernists are doing. I mean, as far as I can tell, the postmodernists aren't saying that the groups, the individuals within those groups, are characterized by any stable characteristics whatsoever, except for the fact of their comparative oppression. Like, so I don't understand the first part of your argument. I mean, part of the reason the postmodern types have been going after me is because I, I've dared to say that men and women differ in temperament, which, by the way, they do. 